Hello everyone, DM Gashbad here. Often when I make a terrain piece, I intend to make a video about the creation of it, but a couple of things often get in the way. One is that I'm usually doing something for the first time, not sure if it's gonna work out, so I don't know if I should make a video about it at all. The other is I often get excited about the project and go ahead and do it, just skipping the whole video process just because I can't be bothered to take the time or it's not an inconvenient spot for me to do the video or whatever. But in this case, I do have the capability of doing it. The main reason is, is because I'm about to do the next Gloomhaven scenario and we have to make these little stalagmites with the rune stones, um, you know, just these bits of rock with a little um, inset glowing uh, sigil in it. And I thought I needed three. So I went and made those really quick and didn't make a video about it. But it turns out I need four. So this gives me a great opportunity to go over what I did to make these because these make pretty good scattered terrain pieces for just about anything. You can leave off the little rune if you want, but I've used these in lots and lots of games. They're really handy and they're really simple to make. So if you haven't done these before, you know, I, I encourage you to give it a try. So this isn't going to be necessary for a lot of games, but for this, we have to make these actually fit the hexes that I will be using for Gloomhaven. So I need a little template to get the base size, the right uh, dimensions. Now you could do this a whole bunch of different ways. You can take the little markers that they have and just go off of those. You can measure how far they are and just draw one on the computer, print it out and cut that out. What I actually did, because I didn't really own a copy in the very beginning, was I just took a little piece of paper like this, uh, folded it to the right height, then marked off where the corners were. There's a corner, there's a corner, there's a corner. And then just cut it out, you know, Cut that out, turn it around, do the same thing on the other side, and it ended up with something like this. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to get something to use as the base. And for small terrain pieces, I like to use plastic card. Cardboard doesn't work out great. Even with small projects, it tends to warp, and it's not really worth the trouble of going and getting and cutting and beveling some hardboard for something this small. Plastic card works just great. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my template. I'm going to draw out the size of the base that I want. And again, if you're not doing this for a board game and it doesn't really matter, then you, know, you can just skip this step and cut it out however you like. Now you can easily enough cut this with scissors. I got my Zacto. I'm just gonna cut that out real quick, but I don't need to bore you with that. So we'll cut and come back in a minute. So now we have our basic shape cut out. So I did go and just take some of the points off of the edges because I want it to look a little organic, especially if I'm using it in another game. And I also am going to go through and I'm going to just bevel these edges just a little bit, just so it's not quite as harsh of an angle uh, on the edge of the base. So with that more or less sorted out, I'm going to set that aside and I'm going to go on to the next step, which is making the actual rock formation. And for that, of course, I'm going to use styrofoam. I'm going to use XPS foam, extruded polystyrene. Um, it's the pink or blue insulation foam. You can get these in giant sheets, smaller sheets. It's one of the best terrain materials ever. Um, you, you'll be hard pressed finding a terrain making YouTube channel that doesn't use this stuff. And, and it really is fantastic. If you haven't tried it before, I recommend it. Uh, the nice thing about this project is it uses scraps. So I use this little this is a little chunk that I cut off of another project a long time ago. I saved it exactly for something like this. And I'm going to cut it. You could use a hot wire cutter, but honestly, for something this small and irregular, you're just fine with using a knife. Here's a little steak knife. I find that knives with serrations work a little better for this because you're often not cutting it as much as you are just sawing into it and popping a chunk off. Let me show you what I mean. So I'm just going to saw into this thing a little bit, then I'm going to break it. And then I'm just going to saw some more off like this. And I'm just going to work my way around just 
getting a, you know, a rough stalagmite shape. And I'm just working down. Obviously, I took a much bigger chunk than I needed because, well, it's a subtractive art. You can always make it smaller, so you might as well start off big and work down. And then when I get it to a close shape, I'm going to start going in with smaller cuts. And I'm just going to go in a little bit and just pop a chunk off like that. And again, this isn't precision, but you do wanna avoid doing regular patterns. So you wanna take off different size chunks. You want to avoid doing the same thing on each side. So the benefit of me having done this before, I actually kinda of like how that's turning out. So <clears throat> the benefit of having done this before is that I found what I didn't like. So this one is fine but it's a little bit too conical, a little bit too geometric, so I didn't really love this. Uh, this one tapers to a point a little bit too close to the top. I think it would have been better if it narrowed out a little bit more. I also didn't like the regular divots that I took out of the edge. I think that could have been done a little bit better. This is the, my favorite one. This, um, this one is thicker at the base and then it tapers kind of quickly in this sort of uh, skinny, almost concave point. So I'm gonna try and do something along these lines for this next one. I'm gonna to continue to work on this, um, just moving around, taking little bits off, making sure that it actually fits on the base. I'm gonna leave a little bit of space around the edge because I am gonna put some extra material around there, but you can see how quickly that all came together. So after a little bit more work, we have our rock formation more or less carved out. So now we're just gonna attach it onto the base. I'm gonna use regular white glue. Honestly, white glue doesn't work fantastically with either styrofoam, XPS foam, or plastic hard. But this is such a small thing and it's not like a big thing that has to bear weight or anything like that. This'll work out well enough and, you know, I don't like using hot glue and super glue doesn't work that well either. White glue will work out just fine in this case. It does take a little bit longer to dry for whatever reason. Uh, white glue just, uh, I don't know what the, what the situation is. You can make special styrofoam glues. It's not necessary. I'll give that, I don't know, an hour. And then I'll come back for the next step. So now that our... XPS foam is nicely attached to our plastic card base. It's time to smooth out this section here where it meets. So with that, I'm gonna take out some spackling paste, all-purpose filler, or whatever. And I'm gonna just spread some on with my favorite sculpting tool, which is this dental tool. You can use an old brush, a stick, uh, your finger, whatever. But I'm gonna mix it up a little bit because apparently I haven't used it in a while. And we're just going to spread some along at the bottom to just make a transition between the plastic card base and the foam rock. Make it blend in a bit more naturally. Once you've got that nicely spread on, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some of these little rocks I got it a model train shop a million years ago. And I'm just while the spackling paste is still wet, I'm just gonna sprinkle a couple of those in there. I'm not gonna cover the whole surface, I'm just gonna put in a couple in little clumps just to add a variety of um, just debris. You'll also notice I didn't clean up my area. I didn't clean up this station between one stage and the other. And the reason was is just, uh, like I said, these rocks are a little bit uniform. They're all kind of the same size. So I'm gonna take some of these little scraps and we're just gonna stick a couple larger pieces in there. Yeah, like that. Here's a good one. I'm just making them, you know, shaping them a little bit with my fingernails. Sticking them in to the spackle. 
no real rhyme or reason. Yeah, and then we'll let that dry. Um, drying time for this can vary a lot depending on how much of the spackle or all-purpose filler you put down. If you put down a whole lot, if it's a really uh, deep pile, then it's going to take a while to dry. If it's really thin, then it won't. But we'll, uh, we'll put this down and we'll leave it to dry for a while and then we'll get back to you. With the spackle dry, we're now going to go on to the next part of the project, and that's to add a little bit of finer sand to the edge of this base, just to blend everything in, give a little extra texture, a little variety, put a little white glue down, get a really bad old brush, get the glue pretty thin. We're going to add little spots of it between the larger sand bits. We don't have to cover up the entire spackle. We can leave little bare patches representing bare areas of rock. Anyway, I'm just going to go through, put a little, if you cover up some of the larger sand, that's fine too. Okay, the glue is on. It's time to just add this regular playground sand. Just sprinkle it on. Let it dry for about an hour. Brush off the excess sand with another old brush. And I will see you when that's ready. The glue should be dry by now. So I'm gonna take, pardon me, a brush, brush off the excess sand and Get all this stuff out of here. So you can be done at this point if you like. You have a perfectly functional stalagmite. Just start painting from this stage right here. But for the scenario that I'm running, we are going to add these little glowing runes. So you don't have to carve these in. In fact, at the, in the picture in Jaws of the Lion, it actually looks like they're just painted on. So you still don't have to carve these, but I wanted to go to the extra step. I wanted to actually indent them a little bit. Looks like, you know, make it look like they're magical runes erupting from within. So you can do this a couple of different ways. The most straightforward would be to take some kind of pointy implement and you might actually use a bunch of them. So as you can see, looking at the picture, uh, it looked like a couple of broken circles set within each other. I think it might actually be some kind of weird skull icon, but whatever. We're, um, we're going to do the circles. So I'm just going to go in here and I'm going to draw, let's see, how do they have these? So it's a dot surrounded by a C and then a, a C kind of pointed down. So you just go in here, and this is nice, soft, malleable material. So the pen will actually do just fine to carve this design out with. Now, some people say that Sharpies will actually dissolve the styrofoam as you draw. I haven't had much success with that. It doesn't really seem to work for me, so I'm just using this pen. And if I want to get it deeper, although honestly this is working fairly well, I can take, you know, maybe a little file, put some deeper crevices in here, or even the Zacto. Just carve it out until you're satisfied. So that's one way. There's, you know, nothing too time-consuming or elaborate about this, but next I'm going to show you a really fast way. If you have access to a soldering iron uh, or a wood-burning tool, you can use that. They are not terribly expensive. It's not the kind of thing that I would say is really important to have in your hobby toolbox, but sometimes they are very helpful. They come with a variety of tips, including this very sharp pointy one, which has got all that stuff stuck on it because I've used this on styrofoam before. And it's exactly like the hot wire cutter. You can just take it and immediately start melting shapes. Now this will 
will go with a mind of its own. So you have to be kind of quick and careful because it'll just go. So the other way is more precise and you can get greater detail. Uh, this one is faster. As you can see it just melts straight on through that stuff. So if you've got a bunch of these to do all at once, it's not a bad choice. One thing I forgot to mention if you're using the soldering iron is do it in a well-ventilated area because melting styrofoam does make kind of a, a nasty smell, bad fumes. So let's go on with painting. Uh, the first thing you could do is you could coat the thing with a thin layer of Mod Podge or uh, white glue or something like that to seal it up and then you could spray paint it. If you spray paint it directly like this, it'll dissolve the foam and all your work will be ruined. So don't do that. Um, the other thing about glue and Mod Podge is it might take away some of the uh, bumpy, uh, bumpy texture on here, all these little porous holes that you've got. Now, I decided I wanted to keep that. I wanted to leave it on, but I can understand if you might prefer your rocks to be more smooth. And then, you know, you can also just take like a ball of styrofoam and smoosh this down or anything like that. It's up to you. They're, they're rocks. You kind of can't go wrong. But when it comes to painting, I like to use Delta Ceramco Cheap Craft Paint. And the reason I like to use that on terrain is because I like to use this paint for everything. I don't buy expensive paints. Just if I'm going to mess something up or ruin something, I want it to be cheap. Same with paintbrushes. Notice all the ruined paintbrushes that I'm using. If you have nice paintbrushes and you take care of them, where will you get your ruined paintbrushes from? So, big blob of paint. Get it nice and thin because we want it to seep into all the little crevices in the rock. And then just give it a nice black base coat like that. So now that our black undercoat is done, it's time for the real painting to start. First, I'm going to take this very dark gray, this charcoal, and I'm going to coat this entire thing with that. Once that's dry, I'm going to thin down this black a whole bunch. I'm going to put a wash all over the whole thing. Then I'm going to start dry brushing. Generally, I do about five layers of highlights, dry brushing included. So we'll start with mixing in some of this rain gray into the charcoal. Build up a couple lighter layers, go straight to the rain gray, then mix in some drizzle gray, and then we'll do a final highlight dry brush of the drizzle gray. And I'll do that all in probably a musical montage thing. completely acceptable little runestone stalagmite thing. The next stages are optional. But the first thing that I'm going to do, and I do think that this, this helps, I'm not here to make things look natural. You know, you look at real rocks and they've got blues and reds and greens in them and all that stuff. This is more representational, more symbolic. This is just meant to look like, you know, just just to represent a rock. And so gray just works just fine. But I am going to add in this little nod to realism. I'm going to take some burnt umber, some dark brown, and I'm going to thin it down a lot. So making another wash. And I'm just going to add it into some of the places where dirt would pool up over time. So I'm just going to go through and add little bits 
of brown wash, especially along the base area and also into some of the crags of the uh, stalagmite itself. So I think that makes that look a little bit more natural. The next thing I'm going to do is do the glowing runes in the stalagmite. And for that, I'm not actually a huge fan of source lighting effects in miniatures. Now, when it's done well, it looks phenomenal. There's no arguing that it looks great. But if it's not done real well, it just kind of looks like messy paint, in my opinion. It's just personal taste. But for this, because it is the way that it looks in the, the photos for the scenario, I'm going to do a little bit of, of glow effect on this. And the first thing that I'm going to do, I'm not claiming to be an expert on this kind of thing, but I'm just taking a little uh, golden brown mixed with more of that burnt umber. And I've thinned it down a bit, and I'm just really roughly going to start splashing it around the design that we've carved into our stalagmite. And I'm going to go quite... This is going to be reverse highlighting, so the inner areas are going to end up being the lighter colors and the outer areas are going to be darker. And so since this is the darkest color, I'm really just smearing it all throughout the design and onto the surrounding rock. And since it's wet, I'm going to blend it in a little bit because I don't need this being too harsh. So now I've mixed a lighter shade of golden brown and burnt umber and I'm going to apply that within the sigil just not quite as far as the first coat i'm going to keep going making lighter and lighter colors uh, going further and further into the recesses of this design i'm going to go through golden brown i'm going to go up through this lighter straw and i'm going to go up to white normally when i highlight yellow i go up to bright yellow but i want to try a more intense glow so i'm going to go up to white in this case With that, the terrain piece is completely painted. The last thing to do is to hit it with a little of this spray-on varnish. Let me back this up so you can take a look. And with that, the project is done. Here's an example of what the rocks look, at, look like on the Gloomhaven board all set up. Let's pull some of these out. I believe this was the one that I just created. So. On a standard board, it'd look a little bit like this. Some models to go along with it. It's a real simple, cheap way of making scattered terrain. Again, I think it could use some work on the glowing lighting effect, but it's, it'll get the job done. Here's what scatter rocks look like using that exact same method. So, if you have any questions, comments, observations, concerns, that sort of thing, go ahead and leave them in the comment section. I will see you on the next one.